Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about becoming a transit bus driver, the process of going that you need to go through to be interviewed, to be successful in getting uh, called in to uh, uh, do the training to be a transit bus driver and as well to uh, <laughs> then what is going to happen in the subsequent days after that, okay, in terms of being a transit bus driver as well. We're going to answer questions for anybody who is taking a license this week or has questions about any part of driving, driving uh, commercially a truck, a bus, or getting their license for the first time. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, <laughs> Peaches, hey, how are you tonight? And Dave McLean is here. Dave, are you watching the Super Bowl game? You asked me if I was watching it. I'm not watching it because I'm here doing a live stream tonight. And uh, I think that's <laughs> one of the things is I've been competing with uh, the Super Bowl today. And uh, yeah, the channel's been kind of has been quiet as it often is on holiday weekends. So uh, unless anybody has questions, uh, let's see. What do I need to talk about? What do I need to do? So yes. Uh, I wanted to thank Sonny for uh, bioretention cells. I think that's what it's called. Anyway, it's oh, your oh, Dave is ready to learn how to be a bus driver in Ontario. <laughs> that's a nice Orion. Yes, transit buses. We're getting there. So uh, yeah, that's actually a bus, Nathan, from the TTC in uh, Toronto. The comments aren't showing. There we go, Corey. Thanks for that. <laughs> I put them up because I noticed that they weren't on last week's feed and uh, I forgot to transition them over to the other side. Simon? Oh, how can, how can you measure fifth wheel play? Simon, you'll know when you're driving the truck. You'll feel the trailer uh, slopping around in there. So when you hit the brakes, you'll feel the trailer kind of come forward and then you'll feel it go back again on the thing. There isn't a way to measure uh, fifth wheel play without a mechanic. And they actually have a device that has a pole with a fifth wheel with a kingpin on it and they stick it into the fifth wheel and they jiggle it back and forth. So in order to actually have a precise measurement on how to measure the play in the fifth wheel, you got to take it to a mechanic. Otherwise, the only way you're going to know is when you get slop in the trailer. Uh, when you're braking and those types of things. All right, Samantha, how are you? <laughs> Welcome to the live feed tonight. I see that uh, there are some people who are not watching the Super Bowl. Wild man saw a tour, tour bus at a hotel this summer, taking re retired folks on site, seeing trips around the country, was thinking what a gravy job this would be, stay in nice hotels every night, eat for free. Uh, yeah, and wild man, I can talk to you a little bit about that. I did do a little bit of... Uh, tour coach driving while I was in Australia and uh, so I can talk to you a little bit about that and some of the types of work uh, that you can do okay Jericho Aero, uh, Jericho Royo <laughs> Sam is here Sam is with the rookie auto driving school in the Bronx and uh, if anybody is in New York there look Sam up and uh, lots of great comments and lots of uh, successful students and students that have very, been very happy with the training that they've received there uh, Dave, you took the comment away about somebody scoring a touchdown. <laughs> I caught it just before it went. Okay. Lichen is here, wild man. <laughs> yeah, wild man, it's, it's, it's an interesting job and you do get to go to places. And I mean, it's certainly a lot easier if you're single. If you're not single, then it's, you know, not so much because, uh, there are, you can be away from home for a fair bit. So, Okay. Uh, Lichen, you are most welcome, Sam. Uh, working on my Class B, living in CT. In CT. Lichen, uh, is that a Class B in Connecticut? Is that a school bus? Do they have a separate class of license for uh, buses there? Just let me know that in the comments here. Okay. So, people wanting to know, yep, Eagles scored a touchdown in a surprising way. Well, I'll have to watch the replay to see that. So, okay. <laughs> Barraquette, thank you so much for that. All right, so we're just going to save the comments. I'm going to go through the presentation here. I'm going to get it up fairly quickly and go through that because I think last week uh, I had somebody comment that I got it. I was answering questions too much and yakking too much. So I'm going to get right to the PowerPoint presentation tonight uh, for those people who want to watch it on the replay. So 
Uh, if you like what you see here, by all means, uh, subscribe to the channel, hit that thumbs up button, uh, leave a comment down in the comment section or leave a comment here, all of that helps us out. And if, for those of you watching on the replay, leave a comment if you have any questions at all, uh, things that you don't understand and whatnot, by all means, leave a comment and I'll be more than happy to help you out and answer those, those comments and questions for you. Okay, Big E, hold that question. Uh, because I will answer that question because there's kind of two answers to that. <clears throat> okay, single, no kids, wild man, that is ideal because if you want to get this out of your system in terms of going and being a coach driver and over the road truck driver, that's if you don't have attachments to family, it certainly makes it a lot easier. All right, so get this going here. Um, there we go. Okay. One second, just bear with me here and just put myself down in the corner there. There we go. All right, so city bus driver, and that is an Orion Transit bus with a, a wheelchair accessible ramp. And the ramp is gonna be used for not just uh, wheelchairs and other mobility devices, but also moms that have uh, uh, baby strollers and those types of things. And this is a picture of me not in a transit bus, but this is a picture of me driving uh, Greyhound when I was living in Australia. Some of you have been into the other previous uh, live streams have seen this image before. And the reason that I'm doing this is because I was doing some work on a uh, investigation on a, on a post crash investigation involving a transit bus. And I talked to three or four operations managers last week and I got some really good information and I got some different information from different operations managers. Operations managers are people who are basically re uh, responsible for making sure that the buses go up and down the road. They work closely with the human resources department in terms of hiring personnel. They take care of any sort of discipline and they also match uh, available drivers with available equipment. So if a bus is broken down and those types of things are going to oversee uh, service and maintenance and, and repairs of vehicles as well and they're going to sort of coordinate all of that sort of different uh, operations of the day-to-day -day work that a transit company does in order to provide service and keep the buses going up and down the road so that's what operations managers do all right and we'll get rid of some of this junk here there we go we'll get rid of this there we go that's better and we'll make this a bit bigger Oh, where's the bigger? No, nope. view, zoom, zoom out, zoom in. There we go. Okay. So, for those of you who haven't been here before, don't know me, are new to Smart Drive Test. Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license regardless of class, truck, bus, or car, and motorcycle as well. And also as well, helps you start a career as a truck or bus driver and helps veteran drivers to remain crash free. I'm Rick August. I've been a driving instructor, a commercial driving instructor for the better part of 20 years, and I'm licensed in the province of British Columbia. I also have a driving school. Yes, I have a doctorate in legal history, and for those of you who don't know, legal history is the study of policing, courts, and prisons, and my expertise is in, is in policing as it relates to traffic. I was also a truck driver through most of the 90s, here and there, off and on again, over the road. I did drive into Manhattan and most of the stuff east of the Mississippi in the United States. I also drove through Canada and then I moved to Australia and while I was going to university I drove for Greyhound for a year before I actually got there and then part-time I drove uh, regional for a company called V-Line which is essentially the bus system that hooked up between the different trains and those types of things. So that's in a nutshell who I am. Alright so this week two videos up uh, turning left center left turning lanes I did a video on that and I also caught a car going through a, a charging a yellow light and the vehicle turned left and there would have been a collision had the vehicle proceeding straight through not applied the brakes. So I put those two videos up this week and as well both of those videos are in the playlist left turning playlist. So if you're going for a road test you definitely want to look at this video about the mechanics and the techniques and skills involved in turning left and definitely have a look at those if you hadn't seen those already. So. In terms of being a transit driver, and this also applies to truck drivers as well, and this is my mate Bill, Bill Walker, who some of you may or may not have seen his uh, information about he 
was one of my students and then he went off to northern Alberta here in, in Canada and he became a truck driver two days after he went out of truck driving school. And the way that he found his job as a truck driver was he started looking for a job right away and he started networking. He talked to everybody he could talk to about what he was doing, the fact that he was going to truck driving school and the fact that he was looking for a job as a truck driver. And it's the same with what you want to do. It, you may not get in on with the local transit authority right away, but if you go to work for the paratransit authority, uh, you know, moving people around with mobility challenges and those types of things, or you work for the local church driving a bus and those types of things, all of this work is going to contribute and make you a more attractive um, applicant for the transit authority. So you want to do that before you even start going and getting your license. All right. Now, the other thing, if you need to go and get a license, if the transit authority isn't going to train you, because there are some transit authorities that will train you to get a license right from the ground up. However, if you do go and get your license before you apply to the transit authority, and there are other transit authorities, I did talk to a transit authority where most of the applicants already had their license. And this was in the province of Ontario where there was both a transit license, so class C, and there was also a school bus license, which is class B. And most of the people that applied had a class B, which is considered a little bit higher license than a class C. And I'll talk to you a little bit more in detail about that a little bit later in terms of higher licenses. But if you're gonna go get your own license, what I would encourage you to consider is to think about just getting the highest class license possible. Because if you get the highest class license, oftentimes you're gonna get everything. You're gonna get a truck license, you're gonna get a bus license as well. And that way, if the transit thing doesn't work out and you don't want to do it because for whatever reason it doesn't fit with you, then you always have options of going and being a truck driver or doing something different. And that's one of the attractive aspects of being a commercial driver is, is that there are lots of options. You're not stuck with what you're doing. Now, one of, the, one of the cons of being a driver is, and I'll say this up front, is, is that oftentimes you're only ever going to be a driver. If you work for a company for a number of years, oftentimes there is very little room for promotion. There, I'm not saying that it's not there, but the possibilities, the possibility that you're gonna go and, like one of the operations managers that I talked to went on to be a driver trainer and then went on to be the operations manager, that is, that is rare in terms of drivers getting promoted into something that beyond being a driver so know that and that's one of the reasons I encourage you to get a higher class license with a truck and then you can go on and do something else all right so the interview process and the interview process varies between transit companies depending on where you go and I talk like I said I talked to four different transit companies in Ontario and the hiring process was different uh, one of them was you had to submit an application, you get called in for an in initial interview with the HR department, the operations manager, and those types of things, and usually there's three or four people who are going to interview you. Uh, it's a behavioral question interview uh, process, and basically what a behavioral interview is, is questions that ask you about your past, act reactions that you've had, and actions that you've taken, and choices that you've made in your career and then they base future events on what you did in the past. That's a behavioral question interview. Most, one of, the, one of the common themes amongst all of the transit authorities and all of the operations managers was attitude. This is a job about customer service. Transit operators is your frontline workers and it's about attitude. So they want people who are going to be able to work with the, with the public and they're not going to get, get upset, they're gonna follow policies and procedures and those types of things, and they're going to do their job, and that's what they're looking for. So the one transit authority you had to apply, you went in for an initial, initial interview. If you pass the initial interview, then you did some online questions, you passed that part, you went in for a second interview, and then you went in for the training process if you were hired, lucky enough to be hired and offered a job. Now, you went in for six weeks of training, after the six weeks of training, then you are offered a probationary position, and it's not a full-time position. It's a casual position where you are on probation, and you're on probation for a long period of time, up to a year with some of these companies. It's quite a long period of time. And so you can be on probation if you're hired on full-time. If you're hired on, 
Uh, with other companies, you can be on a casual basis, and, and she was saying that it was not unusual to be on a casual basis for three to four years. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, what you're looking at if you do get hired on and you're working casual because that can be a bit of a drag for some people, and some people may not uh, be able to you know, make it through that initial period because it is a lengthy uh, initial period. Okay, so some of the pros of driving a transit bus. You're always employed. If you're working for a transit company, you, you are not not going to be employed. You're always gonna have work. Uh, if you're on a casual basis with some of the transit authorities as they ask, you're gonna be asked to be available 40 hours a week and you're gonna work 40 hours a week. So, and you're gonna make a decent income. You're gonna get benefits after three or four months and you're gonna get a, a uniform allowance. They do give you uniform and it's as I talked to uh, one operations manager, it's a quite nice uniform. They give you pants, shirts, jackets. Uh, you know, it's about $1,000, which they give you uniform, and then as needed, it's, be, it, it's going to be replaced as well. Most transit authorities make uh, between $20 and $30 an hour. So it's a good wage, a good benefit. It's a full comprehensive benefit package for you and your family, and you get a uniform, and you know, the work's not too hard. Uh, you're not going to work midnights, but you are going to work late if you're working afternoon shifts. If you're working afternoon shifts, you're probably going to work, you know, sort of 6 to 1 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, most of the information, and I'll just say this for the people who might be listening from the States, most of the information I'm giving you is about transit authorities in Canada, and most of my experience with transit authorities is in Ontario. I don't find a great deal of variation, but if you find that what I'm saying is a little bit different in the U.S., just leave a comment there. And for those of you watching on the replay as well, uh, just leave a comment in the comment section there and just give me some information about you know how it's different in the United States. Maybe you don't work in a union shop. Maybe you don't get a, un a uniform allowance. Uh, maybe you don't get benefits and those types of things. So if you could just leave a comment, that would be really great. Okay, so the cons of driving a transit bus. Uh, and I do apologize that I put Union Shop under there. That was an oversight on my part. That was not meant to be a con. <laughs> but one of the reasons that uh, maybe what I was thinking at the time that I put this on here was that Union Shop and the reason it's a Union Shop is that you are going to be based, uh, you're going to be promoted on seniority, not on merit. So if you do a really good job and you think, oh, I should be promoted, well, you're, that's not going to happen in a, in a transit authority. Most of the time, you're going to be promoted on seniority, how long you've actually been with the company. The work hours are not attractive for a lot of people. And I know that, you know, there was a time that I considered being a transit bus driver and working these hours was not desirable for me at all. Uh, you're going to work weekends uh, and you're going to work nights for a very long time, probably much more than a dozen years. Uh, in the beginning, you're going to work split shifts and split shifts are essentially you go in the morning, uh, you work the rush hour in the morning uh, till about nine o'clock and then you go home until about two o'clock in the afternoon and then you come back in the afternoon and you work the afternoon shift, uh, the busy rush hour in the afternoon from about two to six, maybe seven o'clock. You get a full day, but you go home in the afternoon for about four hours. And I mean, for some people that may be attractive. For me, it's not attractive because uh, when I go to work, I'm at work and I come home at the end of the day. I don't want to come home and then go back. All right. Uh, you're going to work the spare board and the spare board is for runs where drivers are on holidays, drivers are sick, they don't come in, uh, they have an extra run, somebody hired a transit bus to take you know, the old folks down to um, you know, shuffleboard and those types of things, so you're going to work that and as one of the operations managers said to me, uh, you know, if you're new at these bigger ur urban transit authorities like in Toronto and those types of places, uh, it's probably going to be better part of 10 or 15 years, you're going to work weekends, nights, you're going to work every statutory holiday. Now, one in the same time, if you work on a statutory holiday on Christmas and Easter and those types of things, you're going to be compensated for that. Um, probably most of these people are going to make time and a half, uh, maybe even double time on, uh, you know, working New Year's Eve or working Christmas or something like that. Now, if you're not customer service inclined, <laughs> you don't want to be a transit bus driver because you're on the front line. I already talked about being promoted on uh, seniority and 
and I also touched on the fact that there's little opportunity for you being anything but a driver, okay? You go to work for these transit authorities, you're always going to be a driver. There's very little opportunity. You might get promoted to being a dispatch supervisor. You might get promoted to being an operations manager, but you're going to be with the company for a lengthy period of time before any of that happens, okay? And as it says down here in the bottom, with most companies, you have to pay your dues. All right. To get your license and part of the training, uh, you're going to need a B license or a C license, and some of these companies will train you. So they will train you right from the ground up. You don't have to have a license. Other companies are going to require that you do, in fact, have a license. And you're going to be taught air brakes, and you're going to have to do air brakes. And as I've said before in other video, or other videos, that these air brake courses are technical. They're outdated. Uh, they're from a point of view of a mechanic. There's in my mind there's far too much information for drivers to understand especially in this day and age of air brakes that are simply not going to fail and if you have a look at this video here on air brakes explained it'll give you the, the, the down and dirty on air brakes okay and then there's how to break a larger vehicle uh, breaking a larger vehicle with more weight and you need more distance and those types of things and there's a lot of emphasis on valves and systems in terms of taking air brakes and you need to be a professional driver you need to know more road signs you need to know heights and dimensions of the vehicle and those types of things because they're you're gonna say well transit buses are on the same route all the time but what happens if there's road work and you get detoured onto another road and those types of things you're gonna to have to know the dimensions of your vehicle so you don't get into trouble and you don't take the roof off or the air conditioning off the top of the bus because if that happens and your operations manager says to you well what happened how come you took the air conditioning unit off well I didn't know and, and that's not good enough for a professional driver so you have to know all of this stuff so have a look at this uh, this um, video as well on uh, road signs in the top 10 signs that you need to know as a commercial CDL driver. Okay, dispatch supervisor. I did talk a little bit about super, uh, dispatch supervisors. Uh, these are your partner in crime when you're driving the bus, the transit bus. And there are going to be times during the day when you're driving the transit bus that uh, you're going to get behind schedule. There's going to be traffic. There's going to be delays. You're going to have too many passengers on your vehicle. Uh, they're going to have to put on extra buses during the rush hour so that uh, they're going to have to put on extra buses to accommodate the extra uh, passengers and those types of things, especially if you are uh, going to a university and those types of things. When I rode the transit in London, Ontario, and I was going to university there, there were often times that the bus was full and the driver just drove to the university because it was full of university students. Okay. So they ensure that buses run on time. They're your immediate boss. They're the ones that are going to say, listen, do this or do that. You know, drive past two bus stops because there's another bus directly behind you and that bus will be responsible for picking up the passengers at those stops. So they're responsible for that. Now, one of the other things I want to talk a little bit about is transit buses versus school buses because these two buses, these two types of buses are incredibly different. Okay, transit buses pull over to the curve. They have bus bays. And uh, the purpose of a, of a transit bus is to try and get off the road as much as possible to try and facilitate traffic flow in an attempt to reduce congestion within urban areas. Okay, School buses, on the, other, on the other hand, stay on the traveled portion of the road and they do not move off the traveled portion of the road. And there's a lot of things that protect school buses when passengers are boarding and alighting from school buses and the flashing lights stop arms the law is uh, meets out heavy penalties for drivers that pass school buses and those types of things whereas transit buses don't have any of that protection okay they move into bus bays they have isolated exchange areas and they pull over to the curb and up to the bus stop sign to alight and board passengers. And the reason for that, as I said, was to facilitate traffic flow within the urban center. So know that that's a little bit different than what you're going to encounter if you're driving a school bus. So if you've been a school bus driver and you move on to being a transit bus driver, there's going to be some different things that you're going to have to employ when you're alighting and boarding passengers, okay? So that's essentially in a nutshell about being a transit bus driver. If you have any questions at all, uh, we'll head over to the questions and answers here. And as I said, for those of you watching on the replay, uh, if you are a transit bus driver and you have any different information, all of that certainly helps out the smart drivers who are working towards being a transit bus driver. So good luck on your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. All right, just transition back over here. 
Okay, and Corey's going to tell me to get the comments back up there, so I'll get that back over there. There we go. Okay. Okay, where did it go? There we go. All right. Okay, Brian Lawless in Metro System. Uh, Brian, where are you? Uh, they're going to run 24-7. Um, yes, so you're going to run 24 hours. And that is one of the differences about uh, buses in the United States. There's going to be a lot of bigger uh, metropolitan areas in the United States where the transit system will run 24 hours. Here in Canada, most of our transit systems do not run 24 hours. They only run till 1, 1 in the morning. So that is one of the differences. And thank you for uh, letting telling us about that. Uh, oh, thanks, Sam. <laughs> I was hoping to give a fairly sort of well-rounded presentation on that. Okay, uh, Dave, are you talking about coach buses or are you talking about city buses? Uh, uh, in terms of advertisements on the sides of these buses. <laughs> so Sam was a bus driver too. Were you, who did you drive, which authority did you drive for Sam? Uh, did you drive there in New York? All right, let's see who else. Bartolo, you failed your driving test twice. Okay, Bartolo, why did you fail your test? What was the feedback that they gave you? Okay, Peaches wants to know what the relay valve is on a truck. Uh, Peaches, a relay valve is essentially a valve that sends a message to tell somebody else to do the work. So think of it like if I wanted to send flowers to my mom who lives in Ontario 2,000 miles away, I wouldn't drive to Ontario and get flowers and take them to my mom. I mean, my mom would be really chuffed if I did that. But the faster way to send flowers to my mom is to call on the telephone to the local flower shop and then just get them to deliver flowers to my mom. It's a lot faster and a lot more efficient and that's what the relay valve does. Is when you push down on the foot pedal, the brake pedal, it sends a message to the relay valve which is located near the brake chamber at the back of the unit or near where the braking system or the braking unit is at the wheel and it says, "Okay, I want 6 pounds of pressure delivered to the brake chamber." So it just draws the air directly from the air tank and sends it out and that way it reduces the amount of travel or the amount of distance that the air pressure has to travel in order to apply the brakes and it reduces brake lag in the system. So that's the purpose of the relay valve. Okay, Lycan, straight truck. Uh, just get my B permit. Okay, there we go. All right. <laughs> Nathan, what's your favorite bus manufacturer? Nathan, I think you'd have to ask that for Sam, because Nathan, you're talking about uh, transit buses, right? Because uh, I haven't driven transit buses. I have driven buses in Australia, and the buses in Australia that I drove were all coaches. They were all highway coaches that I drove, and there was such a mishmash of different buses that I drove that I, I just can't remember. Okay, so there's Sam. He worked for New Jersey Transit. Also did charity for uh, Coach USA and Saddle River Tours. Well, that's very interesting. And what, Sam, what was your most interesting uh, tour that you went on with Saddle River Tours? What, what was one of your more favorite ones? Okay. Mutati, are you Canadian? Yes, I'm Canadian. <laughs> No, uh, actually, Mutati, uh, most of the rules in North America are more or less the same. Uh, there's some minor differences, but for the most part, uh, driving rules and driving laws, even if you go to Australia, uh, they are similar uh, around the world. I mean, there's very little difference. I mean, yes, there's going to be some different variations on signs and those types of things and some slight variations on rules, but for the most part, uh, driving in Canada and the United States is going to be more or less the same. So, yeah. Okay, Dave, how fast can a huge bus travel from Toronto to Chicago? Uh, well, Dave, if you're talking about a Greyhound bus, uh, they could probably make that run in about eight hours because Greyhound buses, uh, if you've ever been on a Greyhound bus, they move. They, they, really, they really kick it out. Uh, the Greyhound buses that I drove in Australia did not kick it out because they were all governed at 100 kilometers an hour. That was the fastest they would go. But I know here in Canada, 
Uh, I've seen Greyhound buses, and uh, you're pretty hard-pressed to keep up to them. So they could probably do that run from Toronto to Chicago in a Greyhound bus in about eight hours uh, is what they could do. Okay. Um, okay, Dave. <laughs> I'll tell you this, from the experience that I've had with driving older transit buses and driving coaches, is that when they're in the lower gears, and because we have electronic diesel engines, what you do is you just put, you just put the throttle on the floor. You just push it right to the floor. And uh, once the vehicle gets up to the speed, because most of these vehicles are all automatics, uh, you just lift the pedal up and then just get it at the cruising speed that you want to go. Because, because they're so big and because you have so much weight that you're trying to move, uh, you really just want to get it going uh, and that's that's the fastest way to do it okay there we go so Sam most of the work he did was uh, picking up people in New York and New Jersey and taking them to Atlantic City uh, Jersey for the casinos there you go Atlantic City New Jersey for the casinos <laughs> well that must have been lots of fun did you get lots of tips uh, Sam with doing the tour bus driving down to the casino and those types of things I mean especially if people uh, one big at the casino. I'm sure that they were giving you tips and whatnot. <laughs> Dave, that's fast for a bus. Yeah, they're gonna do. Uh, they're gonna kick along there. I know that for a fact. Uh, I remember one night, Dave. I got on a Greyhound out of Toronto, and I was going to London. And I bet you that guy was doing 130, 140 kilometers an hour, which is 80 miles an hour. Uh, that guy was moving. I remember that because uh, unfortunately I was laying in the back of the bus. I was at the very back of the bus and the driver hit the brakes. I don't know what for and I remember coming off the seat. <laughs> okay. Dave, how much is a city bus and a coach bus? Well, I know a coach, a highway coach uh, runs upwards of four hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. I know they're expensive. They're incredibly expensive. I know the buses that they were buying in Australia, the new buses were upwards of half a million dollars, and they were uh, highway coaches, and they were they were pricey. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah, pretty slow day. So most people are watching Super Bowl here. Okay, so Wildman, a lot of the ads I've seen for coach bus drivers here in the States require one year over the road commercial truck driving experience. Now that's interesting that that's what you've seen. Now maybe uh, Wildman, if you could send me one of those ads and I could have a look at it because that's an interesting requirement. I don't think I've ever seen that before that they require over the road commercial truck driving experience uh, because Oftentimes truck drivers are not the best bus drivers because uh, they're truck drivers for a reason because the freight doesn't talk back to them. Uh, I would think that most of these bus companies would want somebody who's much better off, you know, much better dealing with the public and has customer service uh, experience than being a truck driver because, I mean, we can teach anybody to drive the bus. You cannot teach people customer service. I mean, you can to a certain extent. But really, uh, customer service is really the crux of what you want people to do in terms of teaching them how to drive a bus and whatnot. Okay. I think it's going to be a short night tonight. I think we might just wrap this up. <laughs> Patriot's about to make a comeback. There we go. That's awesome. Okay. Um, Sam, yes, indeed. The inside of the bus was so loud because of the music they were playing. The passengers turned the bus into a party bus. I made sure I didn't complain so I'd get a good tip. <laughs> yeah, I got a few tips, Sam, when I was I drove. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning that I drove tour coach for a very brief period of time when I was in Australia. I think I was just looking for some more work. And uh, we went from Melbourne down to Port Phillip Bay, which is, or Port Phillip Island. Port Phillip Island? Yes, Port Phillip Island, where there were fairy penguins, little fairy penguins. And they go out to the ocean for the day, and then at night they come up on the beach and they go up to their burrows and they live in burrows and uh, we used to go down and uh, we would stop at a little farm there and they had some kangaroos and wallabies and those types of things and our kangaroo kangaroos and wombats wallabies and kangaroos are the same thing <laughs> wallabies are just smaller smaller and they had some other animals Australian animals and those types of things so we stopped there for a little bit and then we oftentimes in the summer we would go for dinner first because they didn't come out until dark and uh, we would go into a restaurant. It was in a town called Cow's. So, of course, I had to tell cow jokes. 
uh, while I was driving in there and those types of things. So, and, uh, you know, um, you know, what do you call a cow that just gave birth? <laughs> Decaffeinated. So those are my cow jokes that I told while I went into cows. And, uh, you know, we got free meal at the restaurant and whatnot. We went down and got to go to the ferry penguins. It wasn't very, I mean, after you'd been there a couple of times, it wasn't, you know, too much to do. And you just kind of hung around the bus after that. So, but uh, that was one of the things I did. And then the, kind of the drag about it was is that we come back and we didn't get back to Melbourne until about one or two in the morning. And then you had to sort of drop these people off at different destinations at the hotels and those types of things. Because a lot of these people that were going down to see the ferry penguins were tourists in, in Melbourne staying at hotels and you had to drop them off at the hotel so by the time you got back to the terminal to put the bus away uh it was one or two in the morning and then you had to go home so it was it made for a long day okay uh wild man good videos learning a lot uh you got a good channel glad i found it thanks so much wild man that's greatly appreciated uh your compliments and those types of things and uh i really appreciate it and uh keeps me going <laughs> Uh, what's an average wage for a, a Greyhound driving bus? Uh, Dave, most of these Greyhound people are going to make $20, $25 an hour is the amount of money that they're going to make uh, for driving a Greyhound bus. It's, it's a competitive wage. And uh, I don't know Canada because I didn't drive in Canada. As I said, I drove in Australia. But I made $25 an hour in Australia. I got a uniform and, as I said, uh, and Sam may be able to say something to this as well. I did get all my meals paid for and they did put me up in a hotel. And that was the reason that I went to drive coaches for Greyhound when I was in Australia because you got to stay in a hotel. I mean, you said some of the hours were pretty tough in terms of driving for Greyhound and those types of things. Uh, one of the runs that we had was that you would drive to Canberra and you would get you would leave at seven o'clock in the morning you got there at three in the afternoon you slept until three o'clock the next morning and then you took the bus to four o'clock into sydney and came back and the time you got back i think you got back at three o'clock in the afternoon and then at eight or nine o'clock that night then you drive drove the overnight back to melbourne so the hours were not great like you were not driving during the day and you didn't have a regular night shift so uh you know driving for greyhound may not be the ideal either in terms of work hours and those types of things uh which which bus are you talking about Corey? <laughs> I, I don't remember that story that gave you trouble the bus that gave me trouble Oh, is that the one with the passengers on the holiday weekend? Is that the one you're talking about, Corey? <laughs> That's a funny story. Uh, Nathan, would I ever want to be a BC Transit bus driver? Well, I'm pretty busy with what I'm doing now, Nathan, uh, in terms of the YouTube channel. Uh, one of the things about being a YouTube channel, when you first start out, uh, you're thinking, oh, this really isn't going to work out. And then... Uh, once it gets to the size that it is now, it is really busy um, answering a lot of comments and trying to keep up with the videos and those types of things. So <laughs> I don't think being a BC Transit driver is in my future anytime soon. But, you know, uh, I did train some people here who went on to be uh, transit drivers to the BC Transit Authority, and they're doing well, and they like doing it, right? Uh, you know, for some people, you know... They're working at Walmart right now, and then they want to go on and work for BC Transit. I mean, if you're working for Walmart and then you go to work for a transit authority, that is a big step up uh, in terms of your work hours and the amount of money that you're going to make and those types of things. So for a lot of people, it's going to be a good opportunity for them to advance their career and move forward in what they're doing in those types of things. So, yes. Okay, Corey. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Dave... That's a good question. Why do buses have so many ads on them? And the reason that they have so many ads is because these transit authorities are all subsidized. You may not know this, but the fare that passengers put in the fare box does not cover in any stretch of the imagination the running costs for those buses. Uh, most of these buses in Canada, and this probably is similar for the states, are subsidized by the federal and provincial governments to a very large extent. Uh, most of them are, most of the smaller transit authorities are subsidized to somewhere of about 70% by taxpayers for these to go up and down the road. And this is one of the reasons that they have advertisements on them is because the money that the passengers put in the fare box is not enough money uh, to pay to 
have all of the personnel required to keep a transit authority going and moving the buses up and down the road and fixing the buses and buying new buses and those types of things. So that's one of the reasons why they have advertisements on them. And as I said as well, a lot of the government funding is about to the tune of about 70%. There's only one or two transit authorities in Canada and Ottawa Transit is one of those uh, uh, transit companies or bus companies that actually is able to support itself with the fares that it generates because uh, Ottawa Transit is one of the best transit authorities in Canada. I remember riding it after years of riding London Transit and I went to Ottawa and I thought, oh, I need two hours to get to the train station and <laughs> I was there in about 11 minutes. So yeah, that's exactly right, Dave. No, the fares do not pay for the buses in any stretch of the imagination. As I said, these most of these bus companies, uh, city bus companies are heavily, heavily subsidized by the government. So most of them up to the tune are 70, 75%. Okay, so that's why they have so much uh, advertisements on them. Brian, and Brian just said that, yes, it's about 70% in the states as well. So most of these uh, transit companies are being subsidized by the government. The fare that you pay to get ride that bus does not pay for that bus to go up and down the road. <laughs> okay, Thor Corey wants me to tell the story about the bus. Okay, so I had one bus, it was a holiday weekend, I was on the run, the same run that I just explained to you that goes up, goes to Canberra in Australia, and then uh, and then it goes to Sydney, you, you sleep overnight, go to Sydney the next morning, come back, and then you drive back to Melbourne at night. And this bus they gave me, most of the buses, the coaches, the highway coaches, are 52 passengers. So when the bus is full, it's 52 passengers. And when the bus breaks down... They do one of two things. They send another bus out or they send a mechanic out. And whoever gets there first, the other bus or the mechanic, that's what they do. They either fix the bus or they take all the passengers and put them on another bus. Now this bus, they had one bus because the company that I worked for had a mishmash of vehicles. And this one bus would hold 54 passengers. <laughs> and the bus broke down. It broke, out of, uh, broke down uh, right at the border of uh, New South Wales and Victoria. And uh, so we get into the service station and we're there for about two hours and finally the bus broke down. It, what happened was it was it was a shifter with, uh, it was an electric shift and they pumped air through the shifter so it felt like a real shifter. And what happened was there was a short in the wire and when it heated up, the short wouldn't connect so you couldn't shift beyond third gear. So the bus broke down, cooled down for about two hours and then it went again and we everything was fine. We got up to Canberra and the thing broke down again as we're coming into Canberra. And they spent another two hours while I went off to the hotel and whatnot. So I get up the next day and we go into, I go into Sydney on a different bus that they had brought. And I get into Sydney and there's the bus and it cooled down and it worked fine. And uh, that's the bus I'm taking back to Canberra. So I get on the bus and I get all the passengers on the bus and we're driving down the road. And I get on the microphone and I say to the passengers, uh, you know those well-oiled machines that run on time with full efficiency? I, and they all like, yeah, yeah, we know. And I'm like, well, you're not on that bus. <laughs> and uh, the first thing that happened was we had to get fuel because they didn't fuel the bus up because it arrived late and the people that fueled the bus up. So we had to stop and get fuel. Well, of course, as soon as we stopped, we got fuel. Everybody got off the bus and uh, we start going down the road again and the same problem again. It won't shift. So we drive back to the service station and I call the mechanic and I'm like, the bus is broken down again. I can't get it to go. And they're, so they're off the phone and wait another 15 or 20 minutes with all the passengers on the bus. And uh, the mechanic calls me back and he says, we can't get a mechanic out to you today. It's a holiday weekend. It's Sunday and you're going to have to fix the bus. Well, I just broke out into hysterics because this bus had broken down three or four times already on a holiday weekend. We couldn't get it going. And now they wanted me to fix it. Well, again, the bus cooled down. We got it back to Canberra. <laughs> And they could never send another bus out because they had to send two buses out and it was a holiday weekend. They didn't have two extra buses. They couldn't get a mechanic to fix it. They couldn't figure out what, what it was. And I think it took them the better part of two or three days before they actually found the short in the bus. So that was the one problem with one of the buses that we had. Never a dull moment driving uh, coaches for Greyhound in Australia. Uh, have I ever, uh, Nathan, have I ever been on a TransLink bus? No, I haven't been on a TransLink bus. Is there something interesting about TransLink buses, Nathan? Okay, so Dave, uh, transit buses, uh, they have a depot. So 
Uh, when they go back to the depot at night, there are mechanics and other service people. That's their job. We had a guy who worked for Greyhound in Australia, and that was his job. He fueled up the buses. Uh, we didn't have to fuel up the buses. It was rare that we had to fuel up buses. And just on the topic of talking about coaches and, and whatnot, if you do go into a service station and you fuel up the bus, make sure you get on the phone, and it's a lot easier in this day and age because we all have cell phones, get on the phone and call the restaurant that's going to be at the service station or the service station and say, listen, I'm bringing in a coach. I've got 35 people on the bus and we're going to be there in a half an hour. Otherwise, if you show up with a bus full of people, 35 people, and Sam will probably say something to this as well, and you just dump them on a service station or a restaurant and they don't know you're coming, they're going to be very upset with you. <laughs> because if you give them some lead time, they're going to get some more staff on and they're going to be ready and they're going to have a bunch of stuff ready for the passengers so they can get you in and out of the service station as quickly as possible. So if you're fueling the bus, you can't... Uh, you can't have the passengers on the bus, you actually have to let them off the bus. But as I said, most of the time there's service personnel in the depot and those types of things that they're gonna do that for you. That's not something you have to do as part of being a transit bus driver. And that's a nice thing about being a bus driver as opposed to being a truck driver, because if you're on a truck, uh, you gotta fuel it up yourself, whereas a bus, somebody else does it for you. Okay, so Brian, most transit buses are uh, natural gas or diesel. I do know there are some buses that are electrical here in the uh, LA area. Yes, and you're right, Brian. Uh, some of the buses in Vancouver and other large metropolitan areas are uh, electric as well. So, uh, yes, so it's not always going to be diesel fuel that you're putting in the bus, but it's going to be propane, it's going to be natural gas, or they're going to be electric. So, and Sam said the same thing, you didn't have to fuel the bus. And when I drove buses for, for Greyhound, it was only that one time that I actually had to put fuel in the bus. Most of the time I did not put fuel in the bus. Service personnel put fuel in the bus. And like I said, that's one of the nice things about driving a bus is that you don't have to fuel the bus. And you know, most of the time you don't have to clean it either. Uh, you just bring it back to the depot, you park it, and there are service personnel, that's their job. They clean the bus, they fuel the bus, uh, they do all the other work that needs to be done to the bus. You just drive the bus. So that's one of the nice things about that. And I think uh, I could say the same for transit drivers, that I don't think a lot of transit drivers are cleaning buses and those types of things either. So uh, just know that as well. All right, so I think we're just about out of questions there. I think that gives you a fairly good overview of uh, bus driving and uh, you know pursuing a career as a bus driver and whatnot and if you for those of you watching on the replay if you have any questions or comments uh, leave a comment down in the comment section there all that helps us out if you like what you see here share subscribe leave a comment down in the comment section as well hit that thumbs up button and uh, you know if you have any questions about that uh, or need any more help like I said more than happy to help you out Uh, Dave, yes, Melbourne still has trams and Toronto still has uh, trolleys and those types of things. It's a little bit different. I mean, obviously you're driving on tracks and that sort of thing, so it's going to be a little bit different uh, driving those trams and trolleys. But, you know, we can talk about that in another video and whatnot. So, yeah, we'll just leave it there. So all of you who have passed your road test in the last week, uh, congratulations on doing that. If you've got a road test coming up this week, uh, good luck on your road test this week. And remember, pick the best answer not necessarily the right answer. Have a good night. Bye now.